Lake here at Rickerton High School and these are some of our students who've come along to listen to Mark speak talk about his book. We're super excited, aren't we guys? Yeah. yeah. Well thanks for inviting me. Um, it's really, it's an honour to be able to talk to you about my book. So far away. Do you want a reading first or um, just ask me oh, yeah. questions? The floor is yours. Reading. Yeah. Reading. You want me to do a reading? Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. Okay. This comes from chapter 28. I just um, opened the book at random um, a few minutes before we linked, and I'll just read what came up, and it's, 20, it's chapter 28. Um, and he stands behind Angie in the shadow, where light from the house is filtered by the overhanging branches of a weeping willow tree. Tendrils, pregnant with you, new leaf, form a green lace fringe, as if sheltering them beneath a giant skirt. Angie is sitting on a swing. Push me, she says. He gently pushes on her back. I don't want to be like them, he says viewing the party through the strips of green. Me neither, says Angie. I want to be like Auntie Beth, but she's dead. Push me harder. And your mummy said she was doomed. But Daddy said she was a free spirit and lived life to the full. He said, I'm a lot like her. He said she fitted in more into a short life than most people do into a long life. So it's okay when you look at it that way. And I listen to daddy, not mummy. I don't want to be like anyone else, Callum says. Not one person. I want to be made up of lots of people, different bits of lots of people. I'd like to be like my granddad because people really respect him but I'd like to be like Tama Edwards too. You've stopped pushing. And I'd like to see what Mr. Wallace sees, he says, pushing. Angie says, I want to be like mummy. I don't mean like her, like her. I just want some of the things that she's got. Callum pushes every time Angie comes into his reach. I want horses and a big house like mummy, and I want to live on a farm, but I don't want to be like her. I, know, I want to be like Auntie Beth with what mummy's got. That's what I want. Did your Auntie Beth have children? No. Mummy said she had too many abortions, but daddy told mummy she was being a bitch for saying that. Do you want children? Yes, two boys and a girl. What do you want? I don't think I want to have children, he says. Why not? I'm not sure, but I just can't imagine being a father. And I definitely don't want to be like my father. You've stopped pushing. I think a lot of people don't even think about having children. They just do it because everybody else does it. Sure. But that's what we do, says Angie. We go to school, wait a bit, then get married and have children. But it doesn't have to be like that, he says. I could go on and on and on and on, but I think that's enough, yeah? That um, reading comes from sort of halfway through the book where Angie and Callum have developed their friendship greater but of course there are secrets that we haven't discovered yet between them and they're both really questioning themselves and their place by observing the adult world and wondering what they are going to be like when they enter adulthood so you've got some questions for me yeah please what do you do when you get writer's block and you can't think of what to write? Huh. Um, I get writer's block when I don't know where I'm going with the story. And that happened quite a lot in this book. It took me five years to write. 
And at one stage, I walked away from it for about nine months because I just didn't know where I was going with the story. And I think in that period, it just stated in my head. And when I came back to write it, it was all there, ready to go. So I don't fight writer's block. I just accept it as part of the, the process for me. Yep. If you're writing in a different historical time period from your own, what are the best places to check historical accuracy? Um, well, that necessitates a lot of research. And there are libraries which, you know, have books and there's Google. And, I mean, we've got so much access to information today, some of it's not great information. But if your question is if you're writing in another historical period, then maybe read Hilary Mantel to see somebody who does it brilliantly with her Cromwell um, novels. Yeah. Research, research, research. Hmm. Did you go to an all-boys school? And if you did, um, what was your school? Was your school like the one in the book? Yep, I did sort of hear that question. Um, yes, I went to an all-boys um, school, um, primary school, and the school in the book is very much based on my experiences at that school. Um, it was at a time when teachers used the cane to discipline us and could be quite brutal. It was a boarding school, although I was a day boy. Um, boys would board there from as young as seven years old, uh, usually farming kids or kids whose parents lived overseas. So, yeah, the, book, the school in the book is very much based on the school I went to as a kid. What gave you the idea for the book? Um, there are many strands of ideas that come for me with novel writing, but I think the, the most sort of fundamental theme which fascinates me and I'm interested in and still interested in is the concept of power and control power and control between individuals, uh, especially, well, in this book, the power and control between the adult world and the world of young people, in this case, Callum Gal, the main character, his friend Angie McDuff, and then the other boys at the school. So to answer your question sort of most fundamentally, it's about developing the themes of power and control and about how those relationships develop. Mm. Um, when you started writing the book, did you know like where you wanted to go with the storyline or did you just kind of make it up as you went along? Um, my process is very much sort of setting in place a very rough idea of what I want to um, achieve in writing the book. In this case, about confronting injustice, um, that power dynamic of where people hold power over others and how people who are in a position of the weakest power can challenge the greater power, as Callum Gow does in the book. But to answer your question more precisely, once I find that once I develop characters, make the characters, something magic happens about I don't know, halfway through the process. For instance, in this book, the Miss Bannisters were quite minor characters in the beginning but I got to really, really like them as human beings and as people. And um, it might seem, seem really weird, but they entered my dreams. They came into my life. <laughs> they, they almost sort of, you know, were watching me, <laughs> making sure I took the right path. So there's something magical and wonderful when you get really into the heart of writing a novel. Your characters become alive. You've created them. 
but then something wonderful happens. So I have a sketch of what I want to do and then let time, as I said, this, this took me five, six years to write. So I gave it time. I didn't rush it off in a year. I can't do that. Mm. Does that answer your question? I've, I've got a question that came from that then. So if you do find characters that then start to develop and you really like, are you then tempted to write a book or a short story or something about them? Um, I've never really done that. Um, in my, when I, I've, I've, this is my second novel. My first novel, I had a few characters who became actually far too powerful and bullying. And I had to kill one guy off, you know, just like, get out of my life. And yes, I did write a separate story about that man. He happened to be a sort of drug-addled um, Vietnam War American crazy guy. And um, I don't know how he got into my, my, under my skin, but I did write a short story about him. So yes, Sally, I do sort of use the characters. They do, yeah. They, they emerge somewhere else. <laughs> um, was writing something you knew you wanted to do from a young age? Um, yes, yes. I, when I was like maybe at high school, halfway through high school, I used to love reading and read a lot and was sure that I was going to go to uni and, I don't know, become a writer. That didn't happen. I did something entirely different and didn't come back to writing until I was in my early 50s. <laughs> so to answer your question, from a young age, I thought I wanted to write, but... I didn't until, seriously, until I was much older. I wrote poetry and short stories all my working life, but um, I was actually told by my parents and by my teachers at school that writers don't earn money. You'll never be able to support a family, you know, unless you're the best. And I, yeah, I listened to them instead of my heart. <laughs> Who is your favourite character in the book? Oh, well, I suppose the character I developed the most and know, know the most is Callum Gal. The story is told through his experience, his eyes. But then, you know, I got to really like the Miss Bannisters, um, the elderly English couple. They, I just loved them in the end. And um, I really liked Tama Edwards. Um, um, and oh, old Billy, Mr. Billington, the teacher. But I think Callum's, Callum's my favourite because I, I know him the best. I developed him the most. Yeah. Um, how did it make you feel when you were selected by the NZCA, CYA for a book awards finals? Um... To tell you the truth, I didn't write this book with an audience in mind. So I didn't know who the readership would be. And when my publishers told me they had put the book into the young adult category, I thought it was going to be put into the Occam's, um, which is adult book. Um, so I, I don't mean to be patronising, but I thought some of the subject material in the book was a bit sort of raw or a bit out there for a younger audience. But I've been told since that, no, like, <laughs> no. So um, I was thrilled and honoured to be, to be shortlisted. Um, yeah, I'm delighted because I, I, I'm, I'm blown away by how popular the book has been. It's been on the Nielsen bestseller list of 10 best-selling books in New Zealand since it was published in November. So every week it's been part of, it's sold really well and it has had very little publicity, but there's something that struck a chord with people. And I can, I can probably, I can probably tell you now that I do follow a model when I write a book, follow a template 
It's called The Hero's Journey, and it was popularized by an author or a writer called Joseph Campbell. And it's um, a very stylized way of writing a book. It's all about a person who's sort of humble and modest and lives their life and then is challenged by stuff that happens, um, um, adversity and danger, and how they respond to that adversity and danger and challenge um, um, sort of matters to how they become as a human, as a person, how they develop. And finally, they come home or come back with um, the knowledge of their experience to enrich the community. Um, and popular movies like Star Wars is based on that model. Many, many books are based on The Hero's Journey by Joseph Campbell. And if you wanna, if you wanna write, look him up on Google and see the sort of template for writing a novel. I, I admit that. And I can also say that I followed another model in the voice of this book, which is one of my favorite books. Um, it's, it's called Boyhood by J.M. Kotze. Um, so I had, a, I had a lot of great assistance from people who had written a lot better than me. Yeah. Um, did you have a favorite book when you were at high school? Um, did you read it more than once? Yeah, I saw this question before because Sally sent the questions um, earlier today. And I do remember a few books when I was at high school. Um, one of them is The Catcher in the Rye uh, by J.D. Salinger, written in 1960. Uh, I don't know if you know of it. It's one of the most popular, biggest selling books ever, um, American. And it is about a young man. And what I can remember so much about this book is that like 13, 14 year old Holden Caulfield had an incredible antennae for phonies. And he used that word all through the book, phonies. His parents were phony. His teachers were phony. He couldn't, he, his search is for authenticity, real people, people who aren't just making it up or pretending to be something they're not. That had a huge effect on me. I wrote, I read it again a few years ago when I was writing this book, just to get the feel of Holden Caulfield again. But there are quite a few books that I, I read when I was that age and have reread. Yeah. Others would be, I don't know, um, I Claudius, which is a historical book. Um, and of course, oh, yeah, my mind's getting a bit. Oh, and of course, The God Boy, which is one of New Zealand's greatest books by Ian Cross, I think way back in the 50s. But that's a, that's a really interesting book, again, about a young man coming to terms with the world he lives in. Mm. Um, did you enjoy high school? And if so, what were your favorite subjects in it? I know I should really probably answer this by saying, yeah, high school's great. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with Holden Caulfield. Um, the catcher in the rye character. I went to a very repressive um, um, all boys boarding school, which was hundreds of miles away from my home. The first few years were a misery for me, but by the time I was in my last couple of years, I'd learned how to play the system. I'd learned how to play sport well, be academic, work hard, and can say that I really enjoyed my last couple of years at school. Um, my favorite subjects were English, surprise, history, geography. Um, but <laughs> to be truthful, I failed you school C English. And then I applied for a recount because I was top of the English class and I failed it again and then I went to appeal. And the reason I failed is because none of the markers could read my writing. <laughs> I can remember the exam. I was so excited about answering the questions. I just wrote like crazy and I can, my writing was pretty bad and they just couldn't read. So, yeah. <laughs> 
So can I ask you a few questions? Are so are any of you guys um, writing fiction, short stories, or have any of you got a novel in mind, or keen writers? Yeah. That's great. I'd re just really encourage you. I think one of the, I think the one of the biggest things about being a writer is to be a reader. Um, the more you read, the more your writing style can develop. Um, and I would, I would say just be, don't, be, don't hold back from following the style of a writer that you really, really like, even though you might realise that actually you're just following this voice or this way, this method of writing. By doing that with short stories, perhaps, you will then develop your own voice, your own way of writing. Um, it's a bit like painters who copy, 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 and then start doing their own work because they've learnt the technique. I think writing is like any other thing that you become really expert at. There's the saying, you have to put in 10,000 hours. You have to put in the time and that's reading and writing. So if you're writing now, plus keep it up, but, and read, 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 yeah. Can I ask another question? Sure. So I'll pop in here. Uh, so did you work in a freezing works once? Because the, the um, description of it is very descriptive. <laughs> yes. Yes, I worked at a freezing works um, on my last two um, summer holidays at school and then for the next three years while I was at university. So I had, like, I think, five or six seasons working at Whakatū Freezing Works in Hastings. And so the description of the brains room and the offal, the slaughtering of the cattle, um, was all from my experience, watching it, seeing it, yeah. Hi, I'm back. Um, when you're looking to write a new book, do you usually, like, try, sit down and try and think of what you want to write the book about, or do you just kind of go about your everyday life and wait till, like, something comes to you and then you're like, wow, that's good, I want to write a book about that? <laughs> It's a really difficult question to answer. I think, I think you have to have something that you want to say and you then create the fiction around that subject. Now, you might want to, as I said earlier, this book is about power dynamics, power and control, and it's about abuse, abuse in all its forms. The grandfather is drugged when he goes to this rest home there's the element of sexual abuse. There's the element of power abuse of adults abusing, well, us taking advantage of, of younger people. So it's a hard question to answer because you can write just for the sheer pleasure of words. And, you know, you might take a walk in Hagley Park and it's an autumn and the leaves have fallen and it's so beautiful and falling leaves remind you that everything has to die. And you, but you know in the spring that there are going to be new shoots on all those trees. So you can write a story about that. What the story really is about is about life and living and birth and death, but you can write about a tree. So yeah, just, I just encourage any, anything that comes into your, your mind. You know, you might, you might be in a kitchen cooking, observing and have a conversation with your mother or your father or your siblings and then just go and write about that and make a story about it. That's, yeah, everything is, is material for writing. From the mundane, just the everyday things to the huge stuff in our lives, love, life, death, the big subjects. <laughs> I think that might, be, that might be all the questions we have for you today, Mark. Okay. Well, thanks a lot for taking an interest. Mark, would you like to end on a reading? Hmm? 
Okay, random. Here we go. Only after he, oh, this is chapter 20. Only after he hears his, car, his father's car leaving does he come out of his room. His mother is sitting in the sun drinking coffee and smoking a cigarette. I don't want to go to school today, he says. Do you feel sick? No. Then you must go to school. We've got swimming practice, he says, and I don't want anybody to see this. He pulls up his pyjama top and shows her his back. The skin is broken in places and crusts are formed over the wounds. I'm so sorry, his mother says. He doesn't tell her he has scratched the welts to make them appear worse. She goes to the bathroom to fetch the red liquid she uses for wounds. I'm having the humble service today, she says, as she dabs liquid from the bottle uh, from the bottle onto cotton wool. He winces and sucks his breath. We must get cracking. The appointment's for nine o'clock. Can we go to the farmer's tea rooms? Yes, of course. <laughs> that's, a, that's in a part of the book where Callum has been quite brutally beaten by his father. Yeah. <laughs> It's not all grown in this book, by the way. <laughs> that stuff happens. So, personally, a reader. Should we have a round of applause for Mark? Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, thanks for taking an interest and keep on reading, keep on writing. Thank you. I hope you're enjoying high school more than I enjoyed school. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very much. Um, My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.